that the FBI and the CIA was forcing him to watch ISIS videos. So these things have the trappings of MK Ultra voice to skull technology. And here at the top of the broadcast, I'd just like to get Timothy's thoughts. Are we dealing with the lunatic or do we have a mind control assassin here, Timothy? Well, it's interesting that the last time I was on with you, gentlemen, and by the way, thank you for having me back. Um, we were discussing this very kind of thing, mind control and uh, the voice of God technology, the ability that the uh, certain agencies within the U.S. government and other go governments around the world have to project thoughts into one's mind, even audible voices into one's mind or, or the room, the space that someone happens to be in. Uh, they have the technology now to project a voice so that uh, you might think that you're hearing the voice of God or, or, or your guardian angel or something like that. So um, this individual did for sure enter into a, a, the, the office uh, of, I believe it was the FBI in Alaska, uh, claiming that they were forcing him to, to watch ISIS videos, presumably bloody, gory ISIS videos. And so if that's the case, then there's a, there's, a good indication that this this individual was being programmed, um, perhaps uh, programmed to commit the very kind of atrocity that he committed in Fort Lauderdale in the airport. Um, and uh, there's a there's a an image that's been circulating through the news. I don't know if it's been confirmed yet, but it's an image of him with uh, one of those um, Palestinian scarfs on, and he's 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 got his finger up in the air like making the, the solidarity symbol with ISIS, um, the solidarity gesture, I should say, um, that people make when they take pictures of themselves, when they want to identify with ISIS. And again, he's wearing the Palestinian scarf. So something was, was going on in this young man's mind that had to do with ISIS, that had to do with uh, the very kind of... of uh, terrorist activity that, that he ended up participating in. So um, all of the signs are there that, that this guy's psyche was being tampered with. And, and, and again, he, it, he claimed, according to the news reports, uh, he claimed that they, and I think when he said they, he was referring to some kind of one of the military agencies, um, were forcing him to engage in some kind of study uh, or absorption of the of the ISIS material, so it has all the hallmarks of a um, it has all the hallmarks of a false flag kind of a a situation, um, false flag, and then in this in the sense that it it happened. I mean, he he murdered, I think it's five people in cold blood and injured eight, I think is what the tally is at this point. And um, uh, but false flag in terms of uh, setting him up to do it messing with his psyche and and disturbing him mentally so i'm not making an excuse for the guy maybe the guy was just really pissed off and and uh started to agree with isis and maybe he just of his own vol volition went in and, and shot these people and uh and and maybe he's making up excuses now in the aftermath it is interesting though that according to the reports that i've seen that after he shot these individuals in cold blood by the way, he reloaded like three times. So what's happening to the courage? Uh, what's happening to the courage of the American populace? I mean, the guy reloaded three times. But, um, but anyway, after he shot these individuals, I guess he sat down on the ground. Yeah. After he, after he used up all of his, after he exhausted all of his ammo, he sat down and waited for the, for the authorities to come and get him. So there's no question that the guy was mentally unstable the, the the real question is um was it programming and this isn't very isis like you know usually your isis folks they'll fight to the death and they'll make you kill them and uh he just sits right. down, and i thought that was odd and this is just exactly uh what matthew Pauly and others have told me that were involved in mk ultra how that they were forced to watch this type of stuff Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'll just have to wait and see. But this has all of the um, hallmarks 
of uh, absolutely a program mind control yeah. killer. And it's trauma based. It's trauma based mind control usually. They have to use trauma, which is extremely insidious. We talked about this in the last uh, wow. the last discussion. It's very insidious. They use trauma to fracture your your psyche, and they they break it up into they they vault your psyche into into fragmented parts um, so that um, you can get into a certain personality that is that is able to assassinate people in cold blood. But you have to be you have to be uh, your psyche has to be fragmented. And again, they do that through, through trauma-based uh, programming. And if they're making this, if they were indeed making this guy watch, consume um, a lot of ISIS propaganda and, and some, I mean, the, the stuff that ISIS, ISIS puts out uh, on the internet is, is more gory and horrific than any movie I've ever seen. I mean, there's, they burn people alive and, and, um, take these high HD cameras and get in close on the people suffering and screaming. And, and it's really extremely sickening. And I can imagine how if this individual was, uh, um, was subjected to that kind of, of mind control, to that kind of trauma-based mind control, how he would have snapped and lost it. Um, so it's got all, like you said, it's got all the hallmarks. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how Matthew Pauly's uh, testimony of what happened to him, and, you know, he's still – I haven't heard from him in about a month, but uh, as far as the last time I knew, he was still being uh, abducted and, and going through this stuff. But it sounds very similar to the stuff he went through that they go on, uh, go on goes on in Guantanamo Bay, uh, same kind of thing, uh, terrorist uh, – telling him they're, he's a terrorist, going over and over terrorist stuff in his mind over and over and over again. The same questions they're asking people in Guantanamo Bay. Interesting stuff. We'll just have to keep an eye on it and see what develops. And um, the more you become aware, like the last program we did with Timothy, when you're aware of the technology these people have, when you're aware of their agendas and their goals, these things just become pretty obvious after a while when you begin to hear things like this. So we'll just have to... Keep an eye on it, and certainly our prayers are with all those that lost loved ones and were victimized for this. So we'll just wait and see. But let's get into topic tonight. Our topic tonight is the Book of Enoch. And uh, last time, Timothy got to preach a little bit. And uh, if he wants to preach a little bit tonight, he can just go right ahead. I, it seemed like the Book of Enoch was preaching pretty good, uh, just like it was Scripture. So, Brother Timothy? Just tell us about the book of Enoch and take us where you will tonight, my friend. Well, um, I suppose we should start with uh, telling people, for those who are not familiar with the book of Enoch, um, where the book of Enoch comes from. Obviously, by virtue of its name, the book of Enoch is ascribed to Enoch. However, the content is ascribed to Enoch. However, it has been... Um, it is generally accepted that the book is, is pseudepigraphic. In other words, it's ascribed to Enoch, but it wasn't Enoch who actually wrote the book. And I'm not sure about that. Um, but definitely, uh, it, is, it is part of what we call the, the, the pseudepigrapha. So, um, basically, um, the Bible doesn't really tell us too much about Enoch. What it does tell us about Enoch is intriguing and, and unfortunately vague. So it's, ex it's exceedingly intriguing, but it's also extremely vague. Um, we know that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. We know that Enoch walked with God. He lived 65 years. He begot Methuselah. He was the father of Methuselah. And then after begetting Methuselah, he walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters, and then he was not, for God took him, whatever the heck that means. I mean, there's a lot of speculation about that, but it's a very, very strange uh, situation here that we have recorded in, in the Bible of Enoch walking with God for 300 years. I mean, I have a hard time walking with God for 30 minutes. It's, this, is, uh, this is an astounding 
statement. This is kind of like one of those um, personages in, in the Bible, like uh, Melchizedek, who have these very vague um, have these very vague descriptions in the Bible. And what we have to realize is is I think there's a reason why the descriptions that are in the in the canon in the Old Testament are so vague is because there were other descriptions of these events and of these individuals written in great detail elsewhere. So there was no reason to duplicate the information in the book of Genesis or, or, or um, anywhere else in the Old Testament. So um, it's, it's, it's my hypothesis that the reason why the Bible is, is in fact so vague concerning Enoch is because his story was, was well documented elsewhere and was readily available to the writers of the Old Testament and also uh, to those living in the, in the New Testament age. Uh, everybody knew the story of Enoch, and they knew a lot more about Enoch than just that he begot Methuselah and then walked with God for 300 years and disappeared. That's almost all we know about Enoch. It's certainly not all they knew about Enoch. And again, when I say they, I'm referencing the um, the the New Testament era and then the uh, Old Testament era. The 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 the, uh, the Hebrews knew a lot more than we know about Enoch, and that to me is apparent. They knew a lot more. They knew a lot more than we know about Melchizedek as well, and some of these other characters who are who are vaguely referenced uh, in the Bible. So, um, what's really intriguing about Enoch is that we're told that. In the book of Jude, we're told that Enoch prophesied, which is a very important distinction concerning Enoch, because if Enoch prophesied, the writer of Jude is saying that Enoch was a prophet. And in every case, what the prophets prophesied in the Bible, in the Old Testament, was written down. So it's, it's logical to assume that if Enoch was a prophet and he prophesied, that his prophecy was written down. And furthermore, I think we can infer that if his prophecy was written down and we have an ancient manuscript called the Book of Enoch, then, um, then it's very likely that that is in fact his prophecy or, or a work which contains his prophecy. So um, it's right off the bat, given the little that we know about Enoch in the Old Testament, but apparently uh, the knowledge that other biblical figures, Old and New Testament biblical figures, seem to have concerning Enoch. And moreover, the fact that he prophesied, and it's recorded word for word, a portion of his prophecy in the book of Jude, all of this leads me to the, what I believe is the unassailable conclusion, that the book of Enoch is a true testimony of the prophecy of Enoch for several reasons. First of all, it's important to understand that there are actually three versions of the book of Enoch and the person of Enoch. Um, the person of Enoch is and has been throughout history been greatly obscured. There's a lot of um, mythology surrounding Enoch, uh, even in the occult. Enoch is a very important figure in the world of the occult. Many people are familiar with Enochian magic, the Enochian tablets, uh, John D, Dr. John D, who 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 created the Enochian language, um, apparently through intercourse with with some kind of spiritual entities, demonic or angelic entities, uh, created a system of writing and, and so forth, um, which he apparently was in possession of some kind of text relating to Enoch, from which he derived this Enochian language, which is. Um, which I believe uh, comes from the second and third editions of the Book of Enoch. I shouldn't say editions, I should, I should say versions, second and third versions of Enoch, because there are three. Um, the first version of Enoch is called the Ethiopic Enoch, the Ethiopic version of Enoch. Um, and this version of Enoch was indisputably written 
long before the birth of Christ. This is, uh, this is my copy of First Enoch. This is the R.H. This is the R.H. Charles translation, um, directly from the, the Ethiopic, but also with additives from the Greek and Hebrew. The ancient, the um, um, it has the it has the Greek and Hebrew fragments where they differ from the uh, Ethiopic text. So this is a really good translation of the book of Enoch. It shows you where the different manuscripts of First Enoch, this is First Enoch, where the different manuscripts differ. It shows you what the translations are. Um, and so I highly recommend this version, the R.H. Charles uh, translation. Um, we know for a fact, in fact, most scholars agree, there are a few that dissent this position, but they're but they don't have a leg to stand on. The vast majority of scholars agree that that first Enoch, this manuscript here, uh, dates from at least 300 BC, if not much earlier. And some of them believe that this could have possibly been the very first thing ever written down by the human race, which is which is uh, what I subscribe to. I think this was the very first tome ever compiled by a human being. I could be wrong, but that's that's my feeling on it, and, and there's a number of reasons why I feel uh, that this is in fact the first book ever written by human hand. Um, the the content of First Enoch is Christ centric. It discloses more detail, more um, prophetic detail concerning the Son of Man than any other known BC manuscript, including uh, those of the Old Testament. The other two versions of Enoch are esoteric. Uh, Second Enoch, which is also known as the um, Slavonic Enoch, it's also called the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, is most commonly dated after the birth of Christ. And then there's Third Enoch, uh, which is called the Hebrew Enoch, or the, the Revelation of Metatron, um, definitely written after the birth of Christ. And... Um, both Second and Enoch, especially Second Enoch, is highly esoteric, and um, Third Enoch accounts the mystical journey to heaven involving um, uh, Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha, who was the high priest. And so it's it's very um, its content is is um, is very um, it's 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 Jewish mysticism. There's there's uh, there's the there's some Kabbalah elements in it, uh, so I would advise people to stay away from from Second and Third Enoch, and to stick to First Enoch, which we know was written before Christ, and that's important because the Bible says, in fact, an angel told John that the uh, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So if this was written before the advent of the coming of the Son of Man, and it prophesies that coming in accordance with the doctrines that were, that were laid out by the apostles in the New Testament, then we know that this is in fact a true testament. And that is exactly what it does. I just want to um, say something to concur with you about Enoch 1. I definitely agree that that one is definitely inspired in, in every sense of the word. 2 and 3, um, I've done a show about it before. We talked about it a lot. It was, man, this was like two years ago, but it was uh, the good Enoch versus the evil Enoch. And on Enoch, there was an Enoch on the side of Cain as well that wrote a lot of information. That's right. And, uh, which is where a lot of the mystery religions come from. But I just wanted to, if you guys want to go right. back and watch that at some point, you can. But it's uh, Gary Wayne writes about it in his Genesis 6 book. And I believe, Timothy, I've heard you talk about it before as well. That's right. You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, we have to remember that um, there was uh, almost like a counterfeit line following, following in the lineage of Cain. So um, that's a great point. I don't know if, if it was, if it was, uh, Enoch, who was in the line of Cain, who is thought to have written second and third Enoch, I don't know, but I do know that second and third Enoch are definitely not Christ-centric and do not contain the same prophetic insight 
concerning Christ that 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 First Enoch does. And for me, that's that's the validation, the true validation of First Enoch is the prophecy concerning that Son of Man. In fact, as we talked about on the last show, um, it, it is in the is it is in the in, in the book of First Enoch that we have some of those titles that were that were used um, by Jesus himself concerning himself. And some of those titles come almost exclusively from the from First Enoch. So this was a book. First Enoch was a manuscript that uh, was was very deeply ingrained into the Hebrew culture, and it was well known. Just like today, I believe that just like today, children growing up in Christian homes are very familiar with the story of David and Goliath, very familiar with the story of uh, of Samson and some of the more famous um, adventurous tales of the Bible. I think that in, in the same way, um, the Hebrews were very familiar with the story of Enoch as it relates to the book of Enoch. And I think there's a number of reasons why, um, why the Bible itself attests to that. But it was in 1773 um, that the uh, famous Scottish explorer James Bruce returned to Europe after spending six years in Ethiopia, bringing with him complete copies, three complete copies of the Ethiopic version of First Enoch. So that's how the Book of Enoch came back into the pub public purview. And, um, and from there onward began to be um, popularized again after having virtually disappeared from the earth. Um, in fact, the it's we have to um, we can thank the Ethiopic Church, the Ethiopic Christians, for preserving First Enoch because that's the only reason why any of us have a copy of First Enoch today is because the Ethiopian Christians preserved it. By the end of the fourth century, the Book of Enoch was considered heretical. It was almost completely expunged from Christendom by the 6th century. So it was, the, it was the Ethiopian Christians who preserved the Book of Enoch. They translated it into Ethiopic. They inducted it into their canon of Scripture and have held that position ever since, that, that the Book of Enoch is in fact, um, it is in fact part of their canon to this day, to the, Ethiopic, to the Church of Ethiopia. Now, I am in no wise making a case and uh, am, am not interested whatsoever in making a case that the Book of Enoch should have been inducted into the canon of Scripture. That is totally irrelevant to me, whether or not the Book of Enoch should have been in the canon. I can care less. I'm only interested in knowing, in finding out, in verifying if the Book of Enoch is true. That's all that matters to me. I can care less about the arguments of whether or not it should have been uh, inducted into the canon of Scripture, and the endless debate over that means nothing to me. It is completely and totally irrelevant. I'm only interested in whether or not the Book of Enoch is true. Um, so I'll Timothy, I think take a breath and let you guys... Uh, right. well, I did, you made such a great point there um, about this body of material that the ancient people were aware of, and now there has been a real resurgence, not only in the Book of Enoch, but in a lot of this other literature that was so familiar in the time of Jesus. And we're beginning to understand more and more about the Book of Enoch and of other things. And just the way that Scripture quotes the Book of Enoch, it not only gives credence to its inspiration but also to Enoch as being the author and as you know this was firmly uh, defended in the early church by Tertullian and by others in the early apostolic church and as you say uh, later uh, it was suppressed but there has been found as you know in the Dead Sea Scrolls an Aramaic translation of the book of the uh, and when this is translated and this is made public, I think this should forever put to bed 
this contention by some that the Son of Man passages in the book of Enoch was written after the New Testament. When you've got an Aramaic manuscript of the book of Enoch, 150 B.C., that should put that to rest. And it exists. People know it exists. It hasn't been publicly uh, translated and published. But, I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, these are the most profound pre-Christian testimonies of Jesus Christ by the very title he himself used, Son of Man. So uh, that counts for something. That counts for a whole bunch. Guys, before we move away from this subject we are talking about right here, there's a question in the chat that goes right along with what you guys are talking about. So I want to go ahead and ask it from Brian. It says, why did the church quit using Enoch? And, and I think that that's a hard thing to define exactly, but I, I would like your guys' opinion on that. It wasn't It wasn't just the church, by the way. The... the um the Jewish community, the Jewish community also rejected the Book of Enoch, but they rejected the Book of Enoch for a different reason. The reason why the Jewish Church rejected the Book of Enoch was precisely because of all the messianic content pointing to Jesus, who they crucified. So uh, they rejected it because it was so messianic, because it 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 basically um, announced in bold in bold letters that the guy that you guys crucified was who this these prophecies pertain to. And so they had a very good reason for rejecting the Book of Enoch, and that is essentially why the, the, the Jews rejected it. Um, but the, the early church rejected it for a number of reasons. I have a, a personal opinion of why the, uh, the early Christians rejected it. And the reason... By the way, it wasn't just rejected out of hand. There was great debate over uh, the Book of Enoch, and, and, and obviously the Ethiopian church um, said, basically, screw you, and they took the Book of Enoch and inducted it into their canon against the mainstream flow of, of Christian thought in that time. But there was great debate concerning the Book of Enoch. Um, it, was, uh, it, was known to, it was known by and referenced by many of the early church fathers, including... Clement and, and Barnabas, who were friends of Paul the Apostle, Tertullian, as David said, um, Anthenagoras of Athens, Irenaeus, Origen, Justin Martyr, and others. Uh, some of the, these individuals were against the Book of Enoch, entering into the canon of Scripture. Others were for the Book of Enoch, uh, being inducted into the canon of Scripture, such as Tertullian. Uh, I believe that the, the main reason, and this is kind of a paradox to me, um, because Tertullian um, would not have seen what would not have been the guy to argue in favor of the Book of Enoch, um, in my mind, although he did, because uh, I think that it was a Trinity issue. I think that um, the Book of Enoch uh, has some problem has some problematic um, contains some prob problematic uh, phrases in it, and um, and I think it was it was. Uh, it was during that time period when they were just beginning to compile the scriptures during the time of Tertullian, and they were beginning to deliberate about the nature of Christ, the Trinity, a whole bunch of things were floating around. There was very hot debate going around during that time. And I think the Book of Enoch was probably pretty inconvenient on a number of levels. Um, in regards to a number of those debates that were going around. So I think that that's part of the reason why it was, it was tanked in, in terms of uh, its induction into the canon. But again, I have, no, um, I have no desire whatsoever to argue for the induction of the Book of Enoch into the canon. It is, as I said, an irrelevant issue to me. But um, what I do find very interesting is, is what David said, that there, there, we know that a well-preserved ancient Aramaic scroll, an entire scroll of the Book of Enoch, Enoch 1, exists, has never been published, and is privately owned. It's privately owned. Um, which, the question is, why? I mean, and who owns it? So, uh, there is something very mysterious going on here with this with this uh, Aramaic scroll, the complete uh, version that was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We definitely have the fragments that were discovered in 1948 uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Book of Enoch. They're written in both Aramaic and, and ancient Hebrew. 
and then of course we have later Greek fragments, but uh, the ones that were discovered in the book in the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are very well known. And um, the book of Enoch, Enoch 1, forget about Enoch 2 and 3, specifically Enoch 1. The fragments that we have, as attested in the R.H. Charles edition, um, from, the, from the Hebrew, from the Greek, and from the Ethiopian, all agree. There are some very nominal differences. But, but, but the mainline story, the mainline uh, prophecies concerning Christ and, and the, 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 the story of the Watchers, the book from the book of the watchers the first part of the book of enoch are consistent they corroborate the information that that exists in all three of those languages uh, the greek the ethiopic and the uh, actually there's four the greek the ethiopic the aramaic and the and the ancient hebrew so uh, just like the other scriptures just like the other documents uh, that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is, there is very strong uh, evidence and verification uh, that the Book of Enoch was well-preserved in terms of, well, we know it was well-preserved in terms of an entire uh, manuscript go falling into private hands, but it was also well-preserved in terms of the content. The content of the Book of Enoch was very well-preserved. It was systematically preserved. It was consistent across the board for the most part, which tells us, that's an indication, that it was a very important text to the ancients. And, and that, of course, I think it, nobody, nobody that I know will try and argue that the, that the early church and, um, and the, the Hebrews uh, were familiar with the Book of Enoch and, 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 and that it was in wide use and distrib distribution uh, both before and during the time of Christ. So there's a lot of, it's a very paradoxical situation, as I said, why the Book of Enoch suddenly disappeared. Um, and, and, and again, we, we have to be thankful, we have to be appreciate, appreciative to the, to, the Ethiopic, uh, to the Ethiopian Christians who preserved it for, I mean, th th that's why we're even talking about it today. They're the ones uh, who preserved it. It was... Uh, it, it was um, again rediscovered um, by by um, 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 what's what was his name um, um, rediscovered by James Bruce, Bruce, Bruce James Bruce in, in 1773. So that's that that hopefully that gives people an idea of where the Book of Enoch came from, uh, the, a little bit of the controversy surrounding it, and um, and how it came back into the into the. And into the public's into the public arena, because again, it was gone. It was gone. The only ones who had the Book of Enoch were the Ethiopians for a very long time, and then suddenly, a few hundred years ago, it pops back up into the into the uh, into the purview of the, of the of the of the public. I think one thing that's very interesting. I'll just make this a quick comment. But the Book of Enoch itself said this is a book for the final generation. Uh, another interesting thing about Enoch, if you are the enemy and you're planning deception, Enoch is not a book you want to leak because yeah. I can tell you this, the first the first time I read the book of Enoch, my eyes were open to the deception that's been around since the beginning of time. And um, so I can see why, um, you know, at least one of the reasons why that it has not been widely accepted, because I can guarantee this, the evil one has been trying to keep this out of the hands of people for a very long time. And it would just make a whole lot of sense, wouldn't it, since the book of Enoch claims to be a book for God's people in the final tribulation, that the evil one wouldn't want God's people to have it. And there are many people know about the tremendous insight into the sons of God and the daughters of men that the book of Enoch has. And also there are tremendous insights to the understanding of the spiritual world uh, spiritual warfare strategy strategies that are gained from the book of Enoch and the tremendous prophecies. And I've never thought about that until Timothy brought that up. But in the time of Constantine, uh, Eusebius was an Arian. And I could understand why that the Arians would have a part in suppressing the book of Enoch because the son of man, our passages are so strong. And we see definitely the son of man interacting with God the Father. 
So I could see why the anti-Trinitarian Arians would want to suppress the Book of Enoch. I'd never thought of that before, <clears throat> but that makes a whole lot of sense. I think there was reason for the suppression of the Book of Enoch on both sides of the argument, both those who were against the Trinity and those who were in favor of the Trinity. Um, the Book of Enoch has some, some very problematic phrases and statements, declarations concerning the Son of Man, I think for both camps, to be honest with you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make any kind of a doctrinal statement. I'm just saying, I, from reading the Book of Enoch, uh, the Messianic excerpts many times, uh, I see why it was, it was, it was such a uh, controversial uh, text during that time, during the time it began to, to be seen as heretical. Um, but it is interesting, though, because Tertullian was right in the middle of that debate, of the, uh, of the uh, Trinitarian debate. But, uh, but Tertullian, I'm going to read an excerpt here from something that Tertullian wrote, uh, interestingly enough, in a work entitled On the Apparel of Women. Uh, uh -huh. suddenly begins to talk about Enoch. I don't, know, I don't know how the topic of Enoch made it into a book called On the Apparel of Women by he Tertullian. Enoch on the brain. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that, uh, 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 but regardless of, of how it ended up in that book, I think what Tertullian says here is extremely wise. Uh, so I'm going to read this, and most people are probably not familiar with this concerning the book of Enoch. Tertullian was... Um, definitely one of the early voices uh, in the church, very high re highly respected uh, church father. Although there, you know, he's he had some controversial doctrine that he formulated and so forth. But they all did, all the early church fathers did to some degree. But um, he was uh, living in the uh, in the third century, and he wrote this: "I am aware that the." I am aware that the scripture of Enoch, which has assigned this order of action to angels, referring to their intercourse with women in Genesis 6, is not received by some, because it is not admitted into the Jewish canon either. I suppose they did not think that, having been published before the deluge, it could have safely survived that worldwide calamity, the abolisher of all things. If that is the reason for rejecting it, let them recall to their memory that Noah, the survivor of the, de of the deluge, was the great-grandson of Enoch himself, and he, of course, had heard and remembered from domestic renown and hereditary tradition concerning his own great-grandfather's grace in the sight of God and concerning all his preaching, since Enoch had given no other charge to Methuselah than that he should hand on the knowledge of them to his posterity. That's a very powerful point. Noah, therefore, no doubt, might have succeeded in the trusteeship of his preaching, Enoch's preaching, or, had the case been otherwise, he would not have been silent alike concerning the disposition of things made by God, his preserver, and concerning the particular glory of his own house. It continues, If Noah had not had this con conservative power by so short a route, there would still be this consideration to warrant our assertion of the genuineness of this scripture. So here Tertullian is, is making a case in favor of the book of Enoch in terms of its induction into the canon, or at least its receival um, by the, uh, uh, its acceptance uh, in the church. Um, so I'll read that again. If Noah had not had this conservative power by so short a route, there would still be this consideration to warrant our assertion of the genuineness of this scripture. He could, he could equally have renewed it under the Spirit's inspiration after it had been destroyed by the violence of the deluge as after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian storming of it. Every document of the Jewish lit literature is generally agreed to have been restored through Ezra. So he's making the case here that uh, maybe the Jews rejected uh, uh, the book of Enoch because they don't see how it could have made it through the flood. I don't see why that would be so problematic, um, since Noah most likely would have been in possession of the manuscript and would have certainly taken it on the boat with him, but anyway, on the ark with him. But this is, the, this is a contention that uh, Tertullian is addressing here. And Tertullian is saying, even if that were the case, um, it, it's possible that, that, the, that the Spirit would have inspired the rewriting of the Book of Enoch, um, and uh, he... he, 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 he um, he equates it with the rewriting of some of the documents that were destroyed in the Babylonian storming of uh, Jerusalem. He goes on, one more paragraph, but since Enoch in the same scripture has preached likewise concerning the Lord, and this is an amazing statement, nothing at all must be rejected by us which 
pertains to us. And we read that every scripture suitable for edification is divinely inspired. So Tertullian is saying that Enoch is basically is validating the testimony of scripture and is prophesying concerning us, concerning believers. So why in the world would we reject it, in a nutshell, is what he's, is what he's arguing. By the Jews, it may now seem to have been rejected for that very reason just like all the other portions nearly which tell of Christ. Nor, of course, is this fact wonderful, that they did not receive some scriptures which spake of him, whom even in person, speaking in their presence, they were not to receive. To these considerations is added the fact that Enoch possesses a testimony in the Apostle of Jude, which most people are very familiar with, and that testimony that is recorded in the, in the uh, Apostle of Jude, is, as I said, recorded verbatim from First Enoch, word for word from First Enoch. Before all other known manuscripts, the Book of Enoch designates the coming Messiah as the Anointed One, the Righteous One, the Elect One, and the Son of Man. These are the titles that the apostles use to describe who Jesus was. So it's, it, it's, it's very clear in my mind, and, and to many scholars who are willing to, to take an honest look at the book of Enoch, that the apostles were heavily influenced by the book of Enoch. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, uh, again, as we, as, we, as we talked about in the last conversation, Jesus uses the term, the Son of Man, concerning himself, more than any other phrase when referring to himself. The term, the term Son of Man is an explicit title. It's not a descriptor. In other words, it is a title that designates an individual, and that title comes from the book of Enoch. He wasn't just saying, I'm a Son of Man. He was saying, I am the Son of Man. And there's a huge difference uh, in being just a Son of Man and being the Son of Man, as it pertains uh, to the book of Enoch. And Jesus was claiming to be the Son of Man, that Son of Man whom Enoch describes uh, in, in many different passages in the book of Enoch. Um, and again, what is the determining factor for inspired prophetic text, if not the testimony of Jesus Christ? What else? I mean, that to me is the greatest validator. Is the testimony of Jesus true in the manuscript? Is the manuscript speaking the truth concerning the Son of Man? Is it prophesying in advance things which Jesus fulfilled in his life and in his ministry? If the answer is yes, then it needs to be taken seriously. And, um, and the answer in the, in the case of, of First Enoch is a resounding yes. There's no question. And, and, as, and as you alluded to, John, the, the, um, the, the message of the book of Enoch is addressed to the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed, which um, is, that's a statement that is problematic for people who subscribe to the pre-trib rapture, by the way. But anyways, um, so for me, for me, I, I believe that the book of Enoch, that the first Enoch, is a true testimony because of its content concerning the Son of Man. It is, it, it is right in alignment with the teachings of the apostles in the New Testament. It prophesies things concerning Christ that are more particular, that are more defined, delineated, than any other prophecies I've ever encountered, cons encountered concerning Christ um, before he came into the world. And there are many astounding um, 
perhaps save one, save the prophecy uh, that we find, I believe, in the book of Daniel, that literally tells us the very day that Jesus was going to enter into Jerusalem and be hailed as the king. Maybe save that prophecy. Um, it's, hard to find, it's hard to find many Old Testament references of Christ that rival the accuracy, that rival the detail of the prophecies concerning the Son of Man uh, that are contained in the book of First Enoch. And basically, in the passage that you read from Tertullian, Tertullian was saying that the Jews rejected it because there was too much Jesus in it. And the prophecies in the book of Enoch, as you have so well said, are more precise and more strong than any book that we have in the canon. Um, we might give our listeners just one quick example. Um, in Ezekiel chapter, or excuse me, in Enoch chapter 48 and verse 2, it says, At that hour the Son of Man was called into the presence of the Lord of Spirits and named before the Ancient of Days. And this is much like the scripture that Timothy alluded to in Daniel 7, which is the only Son of Man passage that we have in the Old Testament. But here we definitely see the Son of Man and God the Father, which was a real problem for a Jewish mind. And mm -hmm. then, beginning in verse 6, there's a revelation of the Son of Man that you have to go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, to get anything as high and lofty as this. Beginning in verse 6, it says, For this reason he was chosen and hidden before him before the creation of the world and will be with him throughout all eternity. And the wisdom of the Lord of Spirits has revealed him to the holy and righteous. And here Enoch was claiming to have a revelation of the coming Messiah that was more in-depth and precise from anything we see anywhere else. And now, as you've said, that we have the we know it exists and you just you just got to see the hand of the evil one in wanting to hold this down because this is just dynamite stuff and the depth of the revelation here is just so precious and so sweet that this is just uh food for the saints in the last days that's all it is and uh, i just thank god that so many people are understanding the importance of this because it's just a marvelous thing there are so many prophecies concerning christ in the book of enoch that i was <laughs> writing many of them down and i just got weary of it because i mean it's like pages and pages of it from beginning to end of the book of enoch the prophecies concerning specific prophecies concerning christ are sprinkled throughout the book and every one of them has a correlation in the Bible. Every one. There is nothing in the book of Enoch concerning Christ that breaches the doctrine of the New Testament. None. In fact, we can, you, can, you can see, and I'm just, it's funny because as you were talking, I'm just thumbing through the end of First Enoch, and, and, and almost every page my eyes fall on, there's Messianic content that, oh, yeah. is, that is drawing to mind the uh, the, some, of the, the, um, some of the verses from the book of Revelation, from the epistles. And, I mean, it's almost like the book of Enoch encapsulated the prophecies of Christ from the beginning to the end. The, the, the kind of prophecies that are contained, for example, in the book of Daniel are in here. But then also the kind of prophecies that are contained in the book of Revelation are in here. And, and why I find that so astounding is, and I think people really need to, 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 to understand this, is because the Son of Man, as you read from that uh, excerpt, was hidden. The Father hid him. It was a mystery. The revelation of Jesus Christ was a mystery. It, he was purposely, uh, Jesus was purposely represented, represented symbolically in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the ceremonies. Christ was there, but he was hidden. And it wasn't until he came and the apostles began to 
revisit these scriptures and began to reveal how this was pointing to Christ, and this was pointing to Christ, and there he was in this, and there he was in that. And could, you can imagine the explosions of revelation that were happening in the minds of the early Christians under, under the teachings of the apostles. Going back through the scriptures, in light of the advent of Christ, in the aftermath, I should say, of the advent of Christ, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, mm -hmm. appeared to the apostles, walked through the wall, and then he ascended into heaven in front of, their, in front of, in front of the apostles and some of the other uh, who were in the faith. And then the apostles are going back through and realizing that all of this content, content in the Old Testament was pointing to the substance, to Christ. I mean, it must have been mind-blowing. The Bible says that they were meeting daily in the book of Acts, breaking bread. Yeah, I mean, I could imagine why. This, wow. stuff, this stuff was just ex exploding in their minds, going through uh, line by line the Old Testament, realizing that they saw with their own eyes the fulfillment of so much of this stuff, and probably going through the book of Enoch, and going, that son of man, he was here with us before he ascended into heaven. I mean, could you imagine the way that they were preaching to the converts that were coming in daily, being added to the church? Um, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was explosive in the minds of the apostles and the early believers because Christ had just risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, and they were discovering all the prophecies that had spoken of him, that had prefigured him. And in fact, this is what we find when Jesus uh, res is resurrected from the dead and is walking on the road with the two men, right? And they're going through the scriptures. And Jesus basically leads them through the scriptures, showing them that all these things were pointing to me, to him. Uh, I think that we were so far uh, departed from the event. The early church called it the event. The event was the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how they referred to it, the event, because that's what it was. It, was. it wasn't just a event, it was the event. The most important thing that had ever happened in the history of humanity happened during their time, while they were alive. First-hand witnesses of the fulfillment of Scripture before their eyes. This was the event and it was, uh, it was the most exciting, explosive time of revelation, I think, that, that has ever been in terms of revelation concerning the Son of Man. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is because this was part of it. These prophecies were part of that, of that revelation, which had prophesied in such great detail concerning that Son of Man. Um, and what is so exciting, and what was so exciting for the, for the apostles and for the early church was that the prophecies concerning the Son of Man were not just that he was going to come and, and redeem his people, but so many of the prophecies concerned the absolute bliss that was to come. I mean, he appeared, he came, he fulfilled the prophecies, but the ones that have yet to be fulfilled are, so, are, are unspeakably marvelous for those who are in the faith. And so you can imagine the absolute enthrallment, excitement that was stirring in the early church as they were reviewing the prophecies concerning Christ, both in the Old Testament and in the book of Enoch, and very likely in other uh, manuscripts uh, that are lost to us. So this is the kind of explosive revelation, and, it, and, and the revelation revolves around Jesus. And it was the very question that Jesus asked his apostles that is the defining question of the New Testament. Who do men say that I am? Jesus asked his, his, his disciples, who do men say that I am? And what an amazing question with the abundance of prophecy concerning him that they had, that they were familiar with. Remember, they grew up hearing these prophecies the, the, the Israelites grew up being indoctrinated with these prophecies in the temple, religion.
religiously, hearing them over and over and over and over for their entire lives. And yet Jesus asks these men, who do men say that I am? With the abundance of prophecy that had prefigured him, that had uh, prophesied concerning him. And, and of course, some say you are the prophet. Some say you're Elijah and this and that. But who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter got, Peter got it right. You are the Messiah. And when he says Messiah, what Peter is saying is, you are the one that the prophecies are talking about. That's what it means. That's who you are. When he said that to Jesus, you're the guy. You're that son of man. That's what he's saying. You are the Messiah, the fulfillment of all of this abundance of prophecy that we've been hearing for our entire lives ever since we were little kids. You're him, the son of of the living God. That was the true doctrine of Christ given to Peter by God, exactly as that verse uh, reveals that David read from the book of Enoch. He would be revealed to the elect and to the righteous. He was hidden. He was a mystery, but he was to be revealed to the elect and to the righteous. So suddenly this, this person who's hidden with a father, Suddenly he's revealed on the earth and there's an abundance of scripture prophesying in great detail of this man and nobody recognizes him. Hardly anybody recognizes him, but Peter had the true testament and uh, that, is the defining, that is the defining statement of, uh, of not only the New Testament, but of the life of a believer. Who do you say Jesus is? He is the Messiah the literal, the literal fulfillment of every single scripture pertaining to him. Amen. And he is the son of God. And that profession by Peter is much more profound than I think uh, many of us realize. Because we read the Bible and we go, duh, obviously, right? I mean, we read, we read the Bible, but it's, 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 it's even more profound when you consider the fact that these guys were listening to the prophecies of Isaiah, to the prophecies of Daniel, to the prophecies of, of all the prophets that had come before them since they were little kids, literally religiously hearing these prophecies over and over and over and over and over and over and, and following the, 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 the law of the Torah and living the life of the traditional uh, Hebrews. Why? Why were they doing all of this? So that they could recognize and receive that Son of Man when He was revealed. And yet, very few of them recognized who He was. It's astounding to me. Amen. It's absolutely amazing. And when Jesus referred to Himself, over and over and over again as the Son of Man, the apostles didn't say, now, wait a minute, this guy's referring to an extra-biblical book. They didn't <laughs> do it. And, you know, they knew about it because Jude was our Lord's half-brother. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was a copy of the Book of Enoch in the Jesus household. So That's right. <laughs> like you said, that these guys were familiar with. And there's a place here... Uh, in uh, Enoch 47 and 2, where Enoch is prophesying about the last days. And I believe here and in other places, um, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is very high and lofty, as are many of the Messianic prophecies. But in Enoch chapter 47, verse 2, Enoch gets so specific that in the last days, God's people would rejoice because of the Messiah that come to shed his blood. Even goes beyond, we learn that there will be many things from Isaiah that he will suffer. But in Enoch 47 and 2, Enoch prophesied in those days, meaning the last days, the holy ones who dwell above in the heavens will unite with one voice to supplicate, pray, praise, give thanks, and bless the name of the Lord of Spirits, on behalf of the blood of the righteous one, which has been shed, and that the prayer of the righteous may not be in vain before the Lord of spirits, 
that judgment may be done unto them and that they may not have to suffer forever. And I believe here and in other places, speaking specifically of the shed blood of that Messiah that would come, just mind-blowing, just absolutely mind-blowing. And this is the stuff that Peter, John, there was stuff that... Uh, Enoch prophesied of the pre-existence of the Messiah. This is the stuff that the God, that John wrote about in his That's gospel. Right. These guys picked up on this stuff. They really related to what Jesus was saying. And uh, this is why Jesus used the book of Enoch, because this is the way to communicate to his apostles just exactly who he was. That's exactly, That's exactly right. right. And it's, and it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing. Think that this revelation of Jesus came way back in the world before the flood of Noah. The seventh from Adam prophesied concerning the Son of Man who would come and shed his blood for the to ransom us for God, all the way back in the pre-flood world. This was way before Abraham. This was way before Moses. This was seven generations from Adam. I mean, I think Adam was still alive uh, when Enoch was born. Oh, yeah. and, 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 and what's so amazing about this is that this is when the watchers were on the earth. Mm -hmm. The watchers were on the earth when Enoch was getting this revelation. In fact, it's amazing that the very watchers call Enoch scribe of righteousness. In fact, that's a great indication that Enoch is the author uh, because they're calling him scribe of righteousness. Why? Because he was recording the words of God. In fact, they had him draw up a petition on their behalf to take before God, um, the, the petition of pardon on their behalf. Um, they couldn't even look up to heaven. They were covering their faces. And they wanted Enoch to take this position, so this petition to God to read it. To God. That tells you how highly esteemed Enoch was. The watchers knew how much favor Enoch had in the eyes of God. So much so that they believed that Enoch could convince God to pardon them. And uh, later on in the book of uh, Giants, which was also discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the offspring, after the angels are bound, the offspring uh, of the watchers uh, the giants also went to Enoch. Manway, the giant, went to find Enoch and was concerned about the uh, the flood, was concerned about this reoccurring dream he was having of a tablet being submerged in the water and all the names but um, three being washed off of it or four. And um, and so he went to Enoch to, 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 to uh, tell him what this meant because Enoch was known even to the watchers and their offspring as the scribe, as this wise human being who had favor with God. And what is Enoch prophesying during that time? The coming of the Son of Man, both his first coming and his second coming, prophesying it way back then, when the watchers were engaged in the miscegenation and in the insubordination of the antediluvian age. It's... <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing to put all of this together, uh, and and here is and here's this and here's the Son of Man being prophesied, declared right from the beginning by Enoch. And yet, the offspring of the Watchers didn't even know what was going on. They knew who he was, but they didn't know what was going on when he showed up. When Jesus came, when Jesus uh, appeared on the earth. And the, the demon-possessed individuals, um, the demons possessing the individuals would throw them down at Jesus' feet. We know who you are. And Jesus would tell them to shut up. And they knew who he was, but they didn't know why he came. Isn't that interesting? They yeah. knew who he was. They didn't know, there wasn't any doubt in their mind. This was the great judge. This is the Son of God who has appeared on the earth. Why have you come before your appointed time? See, they knew that the hour would come for their judgment. That they knew.
and they knew who would be their judge. It was that son of man who would be their judge. So when they saw him on the earth, they knew who he was, but they had no idea why he had come, which, which testifies to this great mystery of what Christ was about to do. It's the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is, you have, it, it, what astounds me is that you have all of these adepts of the mystery schools, you have all of these occult practitioners that are seeking for the great mysteries, that, are, that want to know the knowledge, the hidden, the secret knowledge, right? They want to know the knowledge of the fallen angels, the watchers. They, wanna, they want to um, learn the knowledge of the, of, the, of the fallen entities, and yet they reject, literally, the greatest mystery, the most precious mystery that God himself had hidden, that God himself had hidden from the eyes of men and apparently also from the offspring of the watchers and perhaps perhaps even the angels this was the greatest mystery the that, that's why the that's why it's the, the the knowledge of Christ is the most precious dynamic mysterious deep thing that we could ever come to know i mean there is literally nothing else that compares to the mystery of Christ nothing and it just astounds me that God, the Father, hid him. He was hidden purposely. And that's why so much of the Old Testament is, for, is, um, is um, symbolic of Christ. That's why so much of what the Hebrews were doing in their lifestyles every day, religiously doing, was prepping them for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were literally being prepped to receive the Lord when he came. And um, when, when, you, when you look, that's why when you look through the lens of Enoch, um, so much of both the Old Testament and the New Testament becomes illumined. It is really it, is. And the, what you said, I really liked what you said about um, how the, uh, the literature speaks of the watchers even going to Enoch. And, you know, Enoch was known in hell. And it's just like the seven sons of Sceva when they were trying to cast out the devil. And the devil said, you know, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? You know, the, the fallen ones, they knew Enoch. And they knew that he was a man that indeed had that authority and relationship with God. And uh, it's just so overwhelming. And I just got- love the way you're bringing it forward. One of you guys, you guys both have awesome like narration voices. David sounds like he could be reading like Adventures in Odyssey, and uh, Timothy gets gets like real hype about it. But um, I was reading First Enoch, uh, chapter forty six. Could one of you guys read that out loud? Because it's such an amazing uh, prophecy. Are you talking and, about? And there I saw, and there I saw one who had a head of days. Yep, the chapter forty six. There, I saw one who face looked ancient. I may be reading a different manuscript. From yeah, we would probably have different translations. Yep. Okay, but, uh, I can read that here if you'd like. Um, there, I saw one who was ancient, and his head was white like wool, and with him was another being whose countenance had the appearance of a man, but his face was full of graciousness, like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me and showed me all the secret things concerning this son of man, who he was and where he was from and why was he with the ancient of days. He answered and said unto me, this is the son of man who has righteousness and righteousness dwells in him and who reveals all the secret treasures because the Lord of spirits has chosen him and whose lot has the preeminence before the Lord of spirits and uprightness forever. And this son of man whom you have seen will will raise up the kings and the mighty ones from their seats and the strong from their thrones and will loosen the reins of the strong and break the teeth of the sinners. He will expel the kings from their thrones and kingdoms because they do not exalt and praise him nor humbly acknowledge that their kingdoms were given to them. And he will expel the countenance of the strong and shame will fill them 
Darkness will be their dwelling, and worms will be their bed. And they will have no hope of rising from their beds, because they do not exalt the name of the Lord of spirits. And these are they who judge the stars of heaven, and raise their hands against the Most High, and tread upon the earth, and dwell upon it. And all their deeds are evil. Their power is in their riches, and their faith is in the gods which they have made with their hands. They deny the name of the Lord of Spirits. They will be cast out of the houses of his congregations and from the faithful who hang upon the name of the Lord of Spirits. I was going to ask you if in your translation, which is almost verbatim with my translation, with the R.H. Charles translation, um, if that phrase appeared, what is the translation the translation that you guys are using, by the way? I'm using the I, Joseph B. Lumpkin translation. Um, so he did he did almost all the, all, I mean, almost every kind of book you can think of is. Um, is that the one you're using, David? I am using the Ken Johnson. Is it, what I'm using, Ken Johnson. Well, I mean, it's whatever translation it is. It's like it's almost word for word with the R. H. Charles translation. And the reason why I ask you that is because when I first started to read the Book of Enoch, when I was a teenager, um, I went to a, I went, walked into a Borders. I think, I think the Borders bookstores have been discontinued, but I walked into the Borders bookstore, and I, I had some extra money, and I wanted to buy a book, and I was browsing around in the Bible section. And I came upon the pseudepigrapha. And the pseudepigrapha, the one that I purchased at Borders, was, was like that thick. I mean, it was like, it was this massive book. And I pulled it off the shelf. And I didn't know what the pseudepigrapha was. And I, was, and I opened it up, and I was reading some of the contents. And there were various different um, books inside of the, the pseudepigrapha, extra biblical texts. And uh, I was thumbing through it. And I remember thumbing through that book, and it contained also the second, second Enoch, third Enoch, first, second, and third Enoch, among other pseudepigraphical works. And I'm thumbing through it, and I'm thumbing through this strange stuff. And I'm thinking, well, this reading little excerpts here and there, and I'm thinking, this, this, is, uh, this is some esoteric stuff here. Um, but it, it wasn't just esoteric. It felt dark and, and occult to me. And then I, I thumbed through and I hit the book of First Enoch and I opened up the book of First Enoch and I read this phrase. Actually, I, I read the first parable. The first parable, this is the very first parable concerning Christ that I uh, found in the book of Enoch. When the congregation of the righteous shall appear and sinners shall be judged for their sins and shall be driven from the face of the earth and when the righteous one shall appear before the eyes of the righteous and I read this phrase whose elect works hang upon the Lord of the spirits. And it was just like I was struck with this, with all of these verses in the New Testament that were flooding into my mind. And I thought, what? And I went and looked at the, the description of the book of Enoch and read that it was that first Enoch is dated before Christ. And I said, this was dated before Christ. And, 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 it's, and it's saying that the, that the works of the righteous would hang upon the Lord of the spirits. We are crucified with Christ. And I began to think of the, the uh, obviously, the, the, the fact that he is our righteousness. That if we have any righteousness at all, the only claim to righteousness that a believer has is Christ. The mm. Bible literally says that he is our righteousness. And the works of the elect are hanging upon him, which, which is an allusion to the cross. And I was absolutely dumbstruck, thumbing through the, the book of First Enoch, reading one messianic pa passage after another, and just, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why such precise, descriptions of the gospel that were written in the era before Christ, possibly in the antediluvian age, in my opinion, most definitely in the antediluvian age, would ever be rejected by believers. And that's, that's, that's where my, um, uh, my journey with the book of Enoch began. And, and, and ironically, I, I went home 
with the book of with the pseudepigrapha, not just the book of Enoch, this massive book. I mean, it probably weighed like ten pounds, yeah. and um, and I tried to kind of hide it under my arm and and kind of escape into my room with it, but um, my dad discovered that I had it and and some other people and and they were upset. Why in the world would I want to read extra biblical texts? And and I could not convey to them that. But but this, I, I don't know about these other books in here, but but this this book, this first Enoch, you have to see what's written in it. I mean, I was just you. you I mean, you don't understand. The doctrines of the New Testament were spelled out in the world before the flood of Noah. I mean, it was the most astounding thing in the world to me. And uh, I can remember, I have fond memories of thumbing through the book of Enoch, um, first Enoch, just being absolutely floored by some of these messianic passages. And, and I mean, there are, there are dozens of them. There are, there are probably over 20 different uh, portions of the book of Enoch that are prophesying specifically concerning Christ in astounding ways. And I have an uh, analysis up on, on my YouTube channel, Timothy Alberino, on the book of Enoch if people want. And I, and I like read a dozen of these things. But... I mean, if, if you don't, if you if you don't want to take our word for it, <laughs> of course you could just get a copy of the book of First Enoch, thumb through it yourself. By the way, the, the the first portion of the book of Enoch is called the Book of the Watchers, and and first the Book of Enoch opens up, it literally opens up with with the citation uh, that we find in the Book of Jude, um, and then. It gives us a little, a little flavor of the messianic content that's to come concerning the elect one, and then it dives in to the story of the advent of the Watchers in great detail, telling us what was going on with the Watchers. And by the way, I believe it was written by Enoch. That means Enoch was writing it as it was happening, as we stated. So this was like a firsthand. This wasn't. This is. This wasn't like Moses writing about Adam. This was Enoch writing about the watchers that were there. They were there on the earth. This, he, was writing in, he was writing a contemporary tale of the advent of the fall of the watchers, their descent to Mount Hermon, and the miscegenation uh, that they conducted afterwards. And so the book of the watchers unfolds the advent of the watchers. It's, and if you get the sense that, okay, this is how the book opens up. This book is being written for the last generation. I mean, here's Enoch, seventh from Adam, writing to the last generation that's going to live on the earth. And what is he telling them? He tells them, basically prophesies the coming of the Son of Man. That's the first thing he does, that all the uh, ungodly are going to be wiped off the face of the planet. He's writing this when the watchers, and excuse my language, are having sex with women and animals. <laughs> that's when he's writing it. He said all the righteous are going to be wiped off the earth. At some time in the future, he's looking ahead. He sees the coming of this, the second coming of the Son of Man. And he's saying, and by the way, Enoch was teaching. He wasn't just writing. He was teaching those who were in the line of Adam, of Seth, presumably. And what is he teaching them? He must have been teaching them these, this information. Don't worry. This mess that's being created on the earth, it's going to be fixed. The ungodly are going to be wiped off the face of the earth, and the elect one is going to come, and he is going to establish his kingdom in the midst of the mischief of the watchers, prophesying the end from the beginning. And I find even in that a prophetic hint that the activity of the watchers is going to be repeated at the end. Because Enoch's writing during the advent of the watchers concerning the coming of the Son of Man, the second coming of the Son of Man, to the last generation, perhaps a generation that's going to be living through a scenario analogous to the one that was happening during the time when Enoch was writing to that, to that last generation. So there's a specific connection, as, as, as you said, John, between um, Enoch and what he wrote and that last generation. And I believe even the context that the book of Enoch was written in is going to be relevant, applicable to the last generation, to the scenario that's going to be unfolding on the earth. So I think there's even a hint 
in the book of Enoch that what the watchers are doing on the earth, this, this thing that's happening in the pre-flood context, it's going to be happening again in some way, shape, or form for those of you for whom I'm writing this book. I got a question. And, go, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no go ahead. Go ahead. I've talked enough. Because you guys seem to have a newer translation. I mean, mine's an older translation because when David was reading the – what year is your translation, David? Or and, and yours? It is 2012. Okay. Uh, mine's, mine's 2009. So I wanted to see what you guys thought about this verse because when you were talking about this – uh, you're talking about the watchers coming back, and, and this verse stood out to me. The first time I read it, it stood out to me uh, big time because you were talking about him. He's going through this. The angels got together, and um, on chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, uh, it talks about, in, in my translation, it says that they made themselves appear as men. Does your guys say the same thing on there, on verse verse 2 and chapter 17 in particular? I'm trying to locate it here. Then they brought me to the place of darkness and to a mountain, the point of whose summit reached to heaven. Uh, read mine. Mine, the, the, the R.H. Charles translation reads, and they took and brought me to a place in which those who were there were like flaming fire. And when they wished, they appeared as men. That's what mine says. I was wondering if you guys said that as well. And um, Okay, wait a minute. This is in verse 1 in mine. It says, The angels took me to a place in which those who were there were like flaming fire, and when they wished, they appeared as men. Yeah, yeah 17.1 in Ken Johnson. Yep. yep those, I've heard so many people debate how the angels um, came into to women and stuff, and like that verse right there always kind of just took the cake for me, but most people... Yeah. Uh, I guess looked over that, and I and I kind of I you know forgot about it for a while, but it's just interesting. Al, you were talking about your experience with it. My experience was I was reading the Bible, Genesis six. I got stuck on that first time I read the Bible after I became a believer. I was I was uh, I used to be a drug addict, drug dealer, all these different things. When I came to the Messiah, all I could do was read the Bible. I started at the very beginning. I got to Genesis six, and I'd never seen that before. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home, Christian school. Never read that before, and I'm like, what the heck is this all about? And so, anyways, it stuck in my mind for a while. You know, obviously, I looked up, I saw Steve Quell's videos and all that, and I kind of put it away for a while and read the rest of the Bible. I got to the book of Jude, and it talks about uh, seventh prophesying, or let's see, it actually quotes it in the book of Enoch. I think you guys actually said this earlier, but in the first chapter, um, I read it in, e in Enoch, and then I read it in Jude, and I'm like, what is this Enoch? I mean, I need to figure out what this is all about because I've never read a book of Enoch before. Like, where where in the world is this? So I picked up a copy, happened to be the right one. Thank goodness it was Ethiopian. It was an old one I have. I gave it to somebody a long time ago for them to read. But uh, within the first chapter in verse 9, I read this verse. It says, and behold, he comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all. And all of a sudden, boom, like this big like light went off in my head. I'm like, wow, this is exactly what Jude said. And I'm already reading it within the first chapter. And so like from then, man, it got me on a, a kick on, on this. And I still read it all the time because like you guys said, we, what were we reading earlier? Chapter 48, was it? Um, if you keep going in that, there's just so many things. I mean, in verse 6 of chapter 48, it says, And for this reason he had been chosen and hidden in front and kept safe by him before the creation of the world forevermore. And the wisdom of the Lord of the spirits has revealed him to the holy and the righteous, for he had preserved the lot of the righteous, because they have hated and rejected the world of unrighteousness, and have hated all its works and ways of the name of the Lord of spirits. For in his name they are saved, and according to his good pleasure, and it is it is he who has regarded for their life. I, I missed the verse right before that started, but uh, I remember reading this, and it just like when I read it, I don't know what happened, but when I remember reading it, it was just like, wow, this is this is amazing because I had at the time I heard so many people saying, uh, you know, that uh, Yeshua wasn't real, Yeshua wasn't for the Gentiles or anything like that. In verse four, it says, "And sh he shall be a staff to the righteous, and they shall steady themselves and not fall. And he shall be a light of the Gentiles and hope of those who are in troubled of heart." And I just, there's so many, I mean, you can keep going. Verse 49 is all about, this is, there's so many prophecies of Yeshua mm -hmm. and Jesus in this book. It's unreal. I cannot believe how many that are just thrown out by the church. I mean, as we speak, there's a guy on, on, on Facebook saying that, you know, the book of Enoch's a heresy and all these different things. And I'm thinking like, how can you read 
these prophecies of the Messiah and think this book's a heresy. I just can't. I can't see it because, like, like you, Timothy, as soon as you read it, as soon as I read it, I knew like something's something is about this book is amazing, and I just it, it really took hold. And I think a lot of it maybe is just people don't read it and and they just they go on what they've heard. But I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Yeah, yeah. And well, I, I, uh, I, uh, go ahead, David. Well, I would just challenge our list, and I know I'm talking to the choir here. Most of our Now You See TV audience uh, would feel as we do on the Book of Enoch, but I'm sure tonight that there are probably some that are listening that have never considered the Book of Enoch. And I would challenge you to give it the Holy Spirit test. Read this book, and I will guarantee you that the Holy Spirit will bless you and bear witness to you that what you're reading is an inspired document. And what I see happening now, and the naysayers are raising their heads. And the same thing happened with the book of Daniel. When the higher criticism attacked the book of Daniel, they tried to late date it. They say, well, the book of Daniel wasn't written when it says it was. It had to have been written later because the prophecies are just so profound and so accurate. And now they're doing the very same thing with the book of Enoch, that it couldn't have been written before Jesus because the prophecies are just too specific. You know, the very term the Apostle John uses, the word, was used by Enoch in chapter 90. And it's the same process. But I would just challenge anyone tonight that has never read the book of Enoch, give it the Holy Ghost test. Read it and see if the Spirit of God does not bear witness with you, and I'm certain that it will. Yeah, there's also a there's an there's an excerpt that says that he will be the light of the Gentiles. Yeah, and uh, many people have said, well, there that's proof that the Book of Enoch was not written pre-Christ because uh, by by Enoch because nobody nobody had there were there weren't any Jews yet, so there was no distinction between Gentiles. Uh, and that kind of language wasn't being used. But what people need to understand is that this is a translation from the Ethiopic text with comparisons uh, with the Greek, this particular one, with the Greek and the Hebrew and Aramaic. And we're, we're getting the, the Ethiopians and the Greeks, uh, the Greek translation are, trans, are transliter not transliterating, they're translating that word Gentile. That's how they're translating it because they know what the Gentile means. In the, in the original, you have to go back and look at the original, just like you would with the Bible. So if you're going to scrutinize the book of Enoch, then you have to get a copy that's going to allow you to take a look at the original words in the Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek to be able to, to rightly scrutinize, scrutinize the book of Enoch. You can't just say, oh, the word Gentile is there, and then throw it away, um, which, is, which is basically the primary argument that that literally is the primary argument i've run into uh people who have contentions with the book of enoch is the word gentile uh, so i think that's a fallacious argument it's it's very easy to understand how how because this is a translation from the ethiopic that word is appearing in there because it was translated by ethiopian christians uh who were gentiles uh so um you know what's interesting is i remember um I, w I lived in Peru for a long time, and for 10 years, and uh, in the Amazon basin. And uh, I was doing other things in Peru. I was already aware of the Book of Enoch. In fact, this copy right here uh, went into the depths of the jungle with me. But um, I was aware of the Book of Enoch, but and, and had been, as I as I described earlier, had been very moved by its messianic content, and, and had read the Book of Enoch. And then I kind of shelved it. And I was doing other things. I was involved in. Uh, other ministries and, and other endeavors. And I remember that one day I posted a video online uh, concerning the ministry that we were involved in. And it was like the very first thing I ever posted on YouTube way back years ago. And I got one comment on the video, one comment mm -hmm. on the video. And you know what the comment said? Enoch and the Watchers. And I thought, what? I mean, the, the video had nothing to do with any of that. And I was so struck by that comment, like, what the heck? What do you mean, Enoch and the Watchers? And I couldn't get it out of my mind because I knew about Enoch in the, in the advent of the Watchers. But I hadn't yet 
turned my attention to it. And obviously, I'm here in Gen 6 Studios right now d doing this broadcast. I mean, this is what I do for a living now is go around the world and basically verify uh, b verify the story that is written here in, in great detail. And But during that time, again, I was familiar with the Book of Enoch, but I didn't know. I, I hadn't really delved into to, to, to anything uh, of any substance concerning Genesis 6 and the Watchers and so forth. I just had a very superficial knowledge of it. But here, this comment, it, and, and it was just, it, I couldn't get it out of my head. Enoch, I think it was Enoch and the Fallen Watchers. Again, the video that I posted online had nothing to do with any of that. And it just, it like, it, 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 I couldn't get it out of my head. I even contacted the person who wrote that comment. And uh, it was this woman. I don't remember what she told me, except for it was didn't make any sense. It was like uh, uh, she went into some rant that I couldn't even uh, I couldn't make any sense of it. It was weird. It was just it was just um, it was bizarre. It didn't mean anything to me. But that phrase I couldn't get it out of my head. Enoch and the Watchers, and I knew that it had something to do with with. Um, I, I had the I had the distinct sense that there was something about my future that was enveloped in Enoch and the Watchers, and that's when uh, that's when I started down the path of, uh, of Genesis six and giants and all kinds of stuff. That's where it began with me. That was the seed uh, that was planted very in a very strange way. One comment on YouTube, the only comment ever on that video, which I've since taken down, but. Um, and so that's how I began this this journey. And so uh, for those who uh, who take a critical view on the Book of Enoch, the messianic texts, the messianic uh, prophecies in the Book of Enoch are self-evident. Number one, but number two, having spent now multiple years investigating. And when I say investigating, many of you are familiar with the work that we do at Gen 6 Productions and the films that we make. I mean going to places, not just sitting behind my computer screen, but actually going and investigating and visiting the, these places that seem to have some kind of a relationship with the pre-flood world and specifically with the fall of the Watchers and their hybrid offspring and testing in the field with the evidence that still remains to this day in stone and and closing in by the way on the bones um, I can tell you the messianic prophecies and history itself the evidence of the pre-flood world verify what's written in this book and, and what's written in this book is what's written in the Bible I mean it is uh, the 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 from Genesis to Revelation um, there is no contradiction. I have not found a single contradiction in the book of Enoch with the doctrines that are taught uh, in the Bible, specifically the New Testament. I would agree wholeheartedly uh, that there is not any contradiction at all. And as the book of Enoch itself claims to be a book for the last days, I am sure that the Lord has used the book of Enoch to inspire you, Timothy, and we're so glad that the Lord took you down that path because your work has been such a great blessing to us and to thousands and even millions of others. And we're so very thankful that the Lord took you down that path, and that path isn't over. And like you said, I think there's just the the confirmations that we're going to see in the future, it's it's going to just stagger us all. I really believe that. So thank you for all of your work. We really appreciate it. And I know I speak on behalf of John and all of our listeners that were just so greatly blessed by it. Well, I appreciate and, the encouragement. Thank you for those words. And John, do we have some questions? I know we're, we're 20 to 12. Do you want to get a few questions in for Timothy? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Um, Thank you, by the way, Donna, uh, for posting them in our private chat for me. I haven't been keeping track. I've been as they're talking about Enoch, I've been reading. Uh, I broke out my old book here that I haven't read in a long time, wow. and it's been a blessing to me to read it again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to like really sit down and read it because some of the stuff that I'm reading uh, once again I forgot all about amazing stuff. So, anyways, um, 
let me let me get up to the top here. And some of these are, you know, they're they're pretty good questions, but some of them aren't exactly on topic. So I'll try to stick with the ones that are at least on the topic of Enoch for right now because um, we'd only have so much time. So um, question, why do you guys think Enoch was taken up? David, because I have no idea. Well, we don't know for sure, but we know that the profound action of God of receiving him up into the third heaven meant that he was a most extraordinary individual. And I think that this was kind of God's amen on the man, the book, his life, and the man that had so many profound revelations that wrote them down to share with us. I think it's just like God saying, amen, here we go. And uh, that's just kind of the way I look at it. And by the way, Timothy, I just had Donna. Uh, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> look familiar. <laughs> there that it is. Bad boy right there. Don't uh, throw that at anybody. Yeah, I mean, you could literally, if you don't want to read it, you could use it for a weapon. But this is uh, the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, the Old Testament, R.H. Charles. I've had this book since the 70s, and uh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> this way back in the 70s, it had the same impact to me. And, you know, I think there's something within us all. You just say Enoch and everybody's ears light up. There's just something within us that lets us know there's a mystery here that uh, we need to find out about. So there it is. There it is. I got the same thing, but a newer version is huge, and it, it's uh, there's so much stuff in it that's jacked up, but the, the Book of Enoch definitely stands out in this book. I've read almost all of them, the uh, Book of Adam and Eve and all that stuff, and I'll tell you, you know, like, nothing stands out like the Book of Enoch, in my opinion. And uh, so, uh, doesn't David think that Enoch is going to be one of the two witnesses? What do you guys think, both of you? I, I think that uh, I'd like. I think there's. A, I personally think there's a high probability of that. Um, I'm. I'm not sure. When it says that Enoch walked with God and was not, and then later on, a New Testament writer says he didn't taste death. Um, by faith, he was translated. Um, I'm not 100% sure what that means. I don't know what it means that he, that because the Bible says it's appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. Every man dies, uh, except for those who will be here uh, during the, the, the second coming of Christ. So um, since it's appointed for every man to die, and every man has died, even Abraham, every man has died, uh, it would seem to me appropriate for Enoch to be one of those witnesses since when he comes back, if he, if it's him, he dies. And that would fulfill that requirement that every man, it is appointed for every man to die once and then the judgment. So I think it would be kind of a uh, poetic uh, irony to have Enoch return to the earth because those two witnesses are slain. Um, I think their bodies are left. What is it for three days in the streets of Jerusalem? So it would, it would seem to me poetic irony if, Enoch and possibly Elijah were the two that returned. But I don't know. I don't have any real strong feelings on that. But I think it's certainly a possibility. I think he's one of the better candidates. And it, in my opinion, uh, and for those that would want to hear my opinion, you can go to our YouTube channel, and I have a teaching there on the two witnesses, where I believe that it will be Melchizedek and Enoch which is very unique. Not many people would pick Melchizedek, but I do that because of the statement in Hebrews, which says that at the time the book of Hebrews was written, he was still alive. But anyway, hmm. uh, I believe that Melchizedek and Enoch will be in my opinion. That's interesting because you're one of the only other people that thinks uh, that Melchizedek is possibly not Shem. And I, and I'm, you know, because of the verse in Hebrews that says he didn't have a father and mother and, all that. So I don't know. I know there's a lot of people that would disagree with that, but I, I I'm kind of with you on that one. The more I look at it. So anyways, I don't know about him being one of the two witnesses, but the idea that he's not Shem, um, in that verse where he's blessing Abraham is, is interesting. I, we, I think we talked about that a while back, but I didn't know much about it at the time. So anyways, um, that I, I'll just very briefly, uh, in Hebrews seven and eight, it says, and here men die that receive tithes, but 
there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And I believe that the Apostle Paul witnessed Melchizedek as alive when he was caught up to the third heaven uh, in in Scripture. But anyway, enough of that. Yeah, that could be a whole other Very subject. interesting postulation there. Yeah. Okay, so this one's a pretty pretty neat question. This is from Calm Crash. He says, uh, what are the thoughts on the Watchers, and does Tim believe, as I do, that Phil Schneider dug up several of them, as Yahweh said, go bind them in the valleys of the earth? If so, is that related to Amos 2.9 and Dumbs? Uh, and, and if you concur, do you believe that the small grays are biological integration suits for the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim? I think we talked about that a little bit on the last I mean, that, show. That right there, that's a loaded question, man. But, uh, the, but no, I do not believe that. I do believe in the testimony of Phil Schneider. I think he was absolutely telling the truth. However, I do not believe that what he found under the earth were the watchers. Um, there was only one watcher who was bound under the earth, and that was uh, Azazel, who was bound in the desert of Dudael. Um. And all sin, by the way, was ascribed to him. That was to whom they were sending this, what we call the scapegoat. That really, that, that word isn't scapegoat, it's Azazel. They were sending the goat to Azazel uh, in the Old Testament um, because God said all sin would be ascribed to Azazel. Azazel was buried down in the, in the desert, and the, it says he had sharp rocks placed on top of him. He was bound, and, and, and so um, he's the only watcher who is, uh, is not in the abyss the rest of the watchers are in the abyss, and the abyss is a lot deeper than uh, uh, than we can than we can uh, drill down for underground bases. Um, and and Peter reinforces this idea: they're they're in the abyss. Um, and so, I do. Yes, Phil Schneider encountered this what we would maybe call a tall gray, um, in terms of them being biological suits for uh, for possessing spirits. Uh, well, let me say that I do not believe that the spirits of the Nephilim are interested in inhabiting biological suits of gray aliens. They're much more interested in inhabiting uh, human flesh because that's what they were once wearing. Is They were hybrids, but they were wearing human-like flesh. They All they're concerned with, if you've ever encountered demons in terms of possessing demons, the only thing they want is to experience the pleasures of the body. It's hard for me to imagine unclean spirits involved in some grand conspiracy. These things are just lusting after flesh. They want to have flesh. They want to experience the lust of the flesh. They want to eat. They want to drink. They want to have sexual intercourse. That's what drives them, and that's all that drives them. Um, and uh, so I, and they afflict. They afflict, and that's, that's, that's their motivation. They hate the human race. They hate us, but they want our bodies, and they want our bodies to, to fulfill the lusts of the flesh that they do not have. Uh, that they do not possess. So um, in terms of, of, of um, gray aliens being biological suits for possessing spirits, well, every account of a gray alien, and I'm getting a little long-winded on this, every account of a gray alien that I've uh, read about, and I've read many. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love the works of Carla Turner, if you ever want to read on alien abductions, the late Carla Turner. Um, the, every account I've seen of gray aliens, these things are very stoic, uh, unemotional creatures. These are not the kind of things um, that I've encountered that would be re reminiscent of these the spirits of the Nephilim, which are ravenous. The spirits of the Nephilim are ravenous and blasphemous, um, if you ever encounter them. They're unclean spirits. Uh, they are not calm and stoic and quiet. They're not like drones. These things are, they have, they, they have no self-control. They're foaming at the mouth, uh, uh, angry and, and, and lustful. Um, and so I don't think that they would be candidates for that kind of, of uh, occupying the bodies of a gray alien. I happen to believe, and this is a different topic, and I won't go down this rabbit hole, except to say that I happen to believe that gray aliens are biological drones. Um, they're 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 mechanized uh, to a degree. Um, um, they're 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 just just as I said, biological drones and drones in my estimation. What was that name, Timothy Carlos Turner? Uh, Carla Carla Turner with a K. Oh, Turner. All of her books are free online. She wrote some very 
provocative things uh, okay. concerning uh, alien abductions. One of the best, uh, she was one of the, the best uh, um, serious investigators of the abduction phenomenon. Her whole family had been abducted. And, and I'll, give, I'll, I'll give you guys a little hint about Carla Turner. I'm sure some of you are going to look her up. All of her works are free online. Um, her books are free. Um, Carla Turner comes to a, an astounding conclusion. Now, I shouldn't say conclusion. She comes across an astounding piece of information concerning what all of this alien stuff is all about at the end of one of her books. I'm not going to spoil it for you. And I'm not even going to tell you which book it's in. You've got to go read through them all to find that nugget at the end of one of her books. All right, guys, one more question for me that has to do with the first part of that question about the, about the, the watchers being bound. Uh, in verse, it's actually, I kind of want your translation on what you guys think about this, the last verse I'm going to read here. But the first one I'm going to read is verse 5 of chapter 21. It says, Then I said, For what sin are they bound, and who have they been cast in here? Then said Uriel, one of the holy angels who was with me and was chief over them, Enoch, why do you ask, and why art thou eager for the truth? These are some of the stars of heaven which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and are bound here until 10,000 years, the time entailed by their sins and consummated. Now, uh, the, the place they're bound is not, there's no heaven above them, there's no earth below, above them. It, it, I didn't read that part of it, but that last part uh, about them being bound 10,000 years, the time entailed by their sins, what does that mean to you guys? Because I've often wondered, is that how long that their sins affected humanity for 10,000 years? Or is, what does that mean? I mean, is that is that is that uh, excerpt specifically? I don't recall. Is it specifically referencing the two hundred watchers, or is it referencing some other angelic entities whom we're not told about? It's hard to say because it looks like because it's literally right after um, what happened with that. Um, it to me, it looks like it's talking about them, but I don't know for sure. Uh, you know, I couldn't tell you a hundred percent because it really it kind of goes from. Uh, verse 17, uh, where they're, they they were talking to Enoch, or chapter 17, where they were talking to Enoch and basically, um, you know, trying to get him to intercede. And then, yeah. and then it goes to verse 19. Um, the angels who had sex with women shall stand here in their spirits, having assumed many different forms of defiling mankind, and shall lead them astray into sacrificing the demon gods. Here shall they stand until the day of the great judgment, and shall be judged and are made of an end. And, mm-hmm. um, and so then it goes on, and, the, um, and then he gives the names of the watchers who watch. And then in verse Which five, argues against, by the way, which argues against the idea that the watchers are going to be released. And, and it also argues yeah. against that they're bound in the earth because it talks about them being bound. Let me read the... Um, okay, and there, in verse 3 of 21, it says, And I saw neither a heaven above nor a firmly founded earth, but a place chaotic and horrible. That's where they're bound, mm-hmm. these seven angels. Uh, but I, I specifically wanted your guys' idea on what the 10,000 years, uh, the time entailed by their sins, uh, what that means to you guys. Because I've often often wondered, and I haven't really had anybody that, that actually talked to it that actually cares what I'm saying here because most people are just like, well, you know, whatever. Uh, there's not that many people you can talk to about the Book of Enoch or anything like that that really cares about what you're saying other than when I'm on the show with somebody that does. So um, what do you guys think that means, 10,000 years? at the time until by their sins. And you guys might have a different translation on that. And that's, that's specifically verse, um, verse six of chapter 21. Go ahead, David. Why don't you field that one? Okay. And in, uh, the Ken Johnson, it says, uh, 10,000 worlds. Now what I believe, and when you read in Jude six, it says, uh, the angels, which kept not the first estate, but left their own habitation. He had reserved in, everlasting chains. And in the book of Enoch, we see certain scriptures which would say there's an expiration date on their punishment. The reason why I believe there's a discrepancy is because two different groups of angels and two different angelic rebellions are being addressed. And there was a rebellion in Genesis 1-2. And I believe that this was the original rebellion of Satan And I believe that some of these are being addressed. And then we know that in the days of Jared, there was the watchers spoken of in the book of Enoch. So the reason why I believe there's different uh, sentences is that there are different groups of fallen angels and different rebellions being addressed. Well, I, 
I concur with that, although I hadn't thought of it before, but I do concur with it. And the only thing I would add is that um, um, the Bible makes a distinction to remember that at some point in time after, after the reign of Christ, that hell and Hades are, are cast into the lake of fire. So uh, the, it could mean that the expiration of that particular judgment, that they're bound in that particular place, expires, and then they're transferred to another place, perhaps even the lake of fire, because that's where the devil ends up and his angels. So maybe everybody ends up in the lake of fire at the end. Everybody, all these different angels and all these different entities that are bound um, uh, under, the, uh, under the sentencing of, of God for various sins, Maybe when their time expires, the next place they get transferred to, they go from the they go from the county jail to the federal prison. Basically, uh, that could be an explanation too that the lake of fire is the ultimate um, locality where all of these entities are going to find themselves. And horrifyingly, also all of the human beings uh, who are not in Christ, uh, which is uh, which is of course a very terrible thought. Can I read chapter 54 to you guys? This is about the hosts of Azazel. Because um, this is interesting to take into account with all this stuff. Uh, and I know we're getting into the time, and, and we're not going to probably have time for any more questions probably after this. But I don't want to go as long as we did last time, if unless you guys are willing to. I, I'm, it's uh, up to you. But it says, And I looked and turned to another part of the earth and saw there a deep valley with burning fire. And they brought the kings and the powerful and began to cast them into the deep valley. And then my eyes saw how they made their instruments for them, iron chains of immeasurable weight. And I asked the angel of peace who was with me, saying, For whom are these chains being prepared? And he said to me, These are being prepared for the hosts of Azazel, so that they may, so that they may take them and throw them into the bottom of the pit of hell, and they shall cover their jaws with rough stones, and the Lord's of Spirit commanded. Um, so... I don't know uh, what your guys' take on that is, but it's interesting to take into context with what you guys were saying um, on that. But it, there's a lot, man. There's a lot in here. It's crazy. I need to really. Yeah, go. there's a lot of bad stuff uh, that's detailed in the book of uh, uh, in the book of uh, uh, Enoch concerning the Watchers. I mean, uh, Enoch. There's some very detailed scenes. Enoch goes through these strange journeys, and he's being shown the punishment of the Watchers. By the way. Um, uh, I believe that, remember, we have to remember that much of the book of Enoch, after the book of the, the book of the Watchers is a historic account. That's, it is a historic account, and it's, and it's, it is, uh, it is unfolded, it is written as a historic account. But then, after the book of the Watchers, the first part of the book of Enoch, Enoch begins to speak in parables, and he's having visions and dreams, and so after we get through the book of the Watchers, which is a historic account, we enter into a very uh, esoteric mode in the book of Enoch. And I don't mean esoteric in the sense of evil or occult. I just mean esoteric that the language is laced with all kinds of levels of information. So um, I don't necessarily think that everything after the book of Watchers is literal either. I think there's a lot. And, and by the way, um, Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and those who were alive during that time, the pre-flood age, I believe, were using much more of the capacity of the human mind, the brain, that they were far more intelligent than we are, and in fact, had a lot more information than we do concerning a lot of things. Um, and we've, I think we've discussed that in, different, in a different conversation. So I think that much of what we have concerning the punishment of the angels, the heavens, the descriptions of this, descriptions of that, is our levels of, of, of esoteric information that are purposely um, very oblique, that are purposely obscure. And they take dissecting. You have to understand the, you have to understand the zodiac. You have to understand all this different stuff to begin to try and dissect a lot of what's being said um, in, in the parables. I mean, they're called parables for a reason, too. So um, I don't know how much of it is literal, how much of it is metaphoric. There's definitely all kinds of, of strange analogies. And obviously, um, Enoch has dreams uh, uh, concerning oxen and, and, and sheep and all kind of weird stuff, and the oxen having intercourse with other animals and then attacking them and and what he's doing is he's, it's a parable concerning what he just got telling us about, what he just got done telling us about, which was the advent of the watchers. And then there's this esoteric, uh, 
explanation of all these things. So um, I think it would be a mistake to approach uh, after the Book of the Watchers, which is the first part. I think when we get into the parables and when we get into the dreams and visions of Enoch, I think it would be a mistake to continue with a literal interpretation from that point on. I think we need to have an understanding that there's some very, very deep uh, mathematical uh, scientific information that's laced into what follows the Book of the Watchers. Yeah, this part seems to be in, in verse in chapter fifty four seems to be a prophecy what's going to happen to him after that as well because it says on the last days they will put him in a pit, a uh, fiery pit, um, furnace the furnace for that day. So it's interesting, man. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you, um, I'm definitely going to have to take some more time to study this stuff. But anyways, let's. Uh, if you guys want one more question, we'll do one more. I'm going to try to find the best one here, uh, not necessarily the best one, but the one that will probably be most you know, provo thought provoking. So, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, this is a tough one, guys. So, I, there's there's a few. None of. Do you guys see any in the chat on the side that really just you want to answer? Uh, that make that that really uh kind of something that you may have wanted to hit on because I'm not seeing anything that we haven't really talked about yet. But if you guys see one over there. You see well, those somebody's asking where the best place to buy Enoch is. You can literally buy the R.H. Charles. And I'm not saying this is the best translation. This is one good translation, the R.H. Charles. Again, the R.H. Charles translation is uh, juxtaposed with the, the fragments of the Greek and of the Hebrew and of the Aramaic, and it shows you in brackets where the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic differ from the Ethiopic translation. So um, it sounds like the translations you guys got are, are almost verbatim. Uh, but just for, just uh, for, uh, for people who want to buy the Book of Enoch, stay away from Enoch 2, stay away from Enoch 3, stay away from the, uh, the revelations of Metatron, uh, stay away from the secrets of Enoch, and just try and find first Enoch, and if you're unsure, get the R.H. Charles translation. I can, um, I can, uh, I can um, recommend this one with confidence. All right. Well, I, w I just want to say thank you again, Timothy, for coming on. It's always a thought-provoking sh uh, show when we have you on. There's no doubt about that. And um, definitely caused me to really look into the Book of Enoch in a deeper way uh, than I had before because um, it's it's so much. And, and I would I would also add, too, that if people would read the Scriptures and then, then read the Book of Enoch, you'll have a, such a deeper understanding, I believe, of the scriptures in general through reading uh, the I book. I might of suggest Enoch. it the other way around. Not okay. because the book of Enoch has preeminence over the scriptures by any means, but because the book of Enoch uh, addresses a lot of what's in the scriptures. And then when you go into the scriptures, your mind is going to be referencing those excerpts from the book of Enoch and it's and it's and it's going to illuminate them. Um, and I think that uh, and I think there's a reason for that because this was written first. Uh, so I'm not again. I'm not saying this has preeminence over the Bible. Right. You're probably right. I mean, it's a good. It's a key to understanding a lot of the Bible. So there's definitely no reason not to. And it and also, also it's it's uh, not that long either. So it's not going to take you very short. Yeah, you know, very short. Very short. <laughs> again, it, it's, it doesn't have preeminence over the scriptures. So uh, I don't want anybody to put words in my mouth. And also. I am not advocating in any way that the Book of Enoch should be included in the canon. Again, that is a moot point for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, yeah, definitely go ahead and read it. I mean, I know this, that when I read it, it, it changed my whole thought on a lot of things in the Scripture, and it really illuminated the ideas that the world we're in living in and illuminated what is going to happen, uh, what we're a part of, because um, most people really don't have any idea that the, all the kings of the earth conspire against Yahweh and conspire against us they don't know that they think that you know they're voting for this or that but in the end they don't realize who the the what paul calls the god of this world is they don't realize that so definitely um just an amazing book to read so and, and don't be scared to read it i know a lot somebody messaged me earlier that their church told them over and over again do not read it do not read it um it's read just the gonna first reinforce chapter. it's just going to reinforce the doctrine of christ amen exactly, exactly. And I, like Timothy said earlier, I've read it, and I do not see anything that contradicts the Word of God in there at all, not even a little bit. In fact, it it upholds it, and there's a lot of prophecies that 
you you were talking about some of the prophecies um, of later on it talks it goes down the line from all the way from Adam all the way to David all the way to, to the son of man it talks about them in fo- allegory form all the way through that and if you know the scripture you see it but uh, it's really interesting so anyways we will um, maybe pick up this talk again